Hey, so my name is Scott, and today we are continuing our series that we've been doing for a few weeks now called Soundtracks. And I want to do a little bit something different today. We've been talking about soundtracks as things that we tell ourselves over and over again. I'm talking about like overthinking or spiraling or worrying. And these are all things that can happen in our heads if we're not careful. We all listen to negative soundtracks sometimes that form who we end up becoming. One philosopher famously said, I think, therefore I am. That was his proof of existence, but I also think it points us towards something else that's true, which is that our thoughts define us. We are what we think we are. And I don't think that this just happens in our head. Groups of people have soundtracks as well. Any group of people, if they get together, are going to eventually have soundtracks that everyone repeats and believes about that group. Families have it, churches have it, uh, businesses have it. One soundtrack that I'm really grateful for that I believe our church has is that this is a really friendly church. I've heard multiple people say that, and I hope that's always true for every single person who walks in our doors. Or it's a whole thing for like visionary leaders to stand up in front of their groups or organizations or businesses and declare the soundtracks that they want their companies to have. They give everyone soundtracks like we will outwork the competition or we dare to be different or people over ideas. And then they say these things over and over and over until other people start saying them too. And hopefully people start acting in the appropriate ways to drive that business forward. Good leaders often do this pretty naturally, but let's go one step bigger. So we have personal soundtracks, and then we have these group soundtracks, and up from there, I think that we have societal soundtracks. These are things that huge groups of people think. For example, one of Canada's soundtracks might be, we're nice. Or in America, they might believe freedom matters more than anything else. In some Eastern cultures, I think it might be that family matters more than anything else. These are the soundtracks and the values that many of us have deeply planted in us because of where we grew up. But there's a soundtrack that I believe has risen for people this century, and especially for younger people. And that's don't trust the system. And maybe that's always been the case for younger people. I'm still in my 20s, so I definitely don't have all that history. But young people today feel that they have been let down by the systems that were supposed to work for them, so they don't trust them anymore. My guess is that young people have always been a little suspicious, and that every generation has made big changes to the systems that they were a part of to make it work for them. I don't think the millennials and Gen Zers are all that unique, even though we like to think we are. Because young people almost always are the ones that drive change. The difference now seems to be that because of the internet, all of these people are talking to each other, and so many more people are talking about all of the things that aren't working for them. And so then they try to tear all of these systems down all at once. So people are mad at their parents, and the government, and universities, and the stock market, and the housing market, and the job market, and all of these different institutions because they feel like they have not lived up to the deal that they were supposed to. Or like they did the work and those systems didn't come through. But here's the truth. The other system that a lot of people are upset with is the church, maybe more broadly, religion. But what people are doing with all these other systems is they're taking apart what they thought should be true about them, and they're trying to build it back up. The big buzzword for this is deconstruction, and hopefully reconstruction. They're taking what they once believed to be true apart, and people are doing that to the church too. So after a couple of years of this becoming really front and center issue for church leaders, we're talking about it today. 
Why are so many people deconstructing and what can we do about it? And is there hope to get through deconstruction into a healthy reconstruction? Because we all have doubts. Let's be honest about that. All of us have doubted at one time or another. But I don't believe that doubt is bad. It feels scary though. It's scary to doubt what you've always believed and what you've given your life to. It's scary to watch friends doubt the faith that they once held on to. It's really scary for parents to watch their children doubt the faith that they were trying to pass on to them. But I believe that God isn't scared of doubt. He's not scared of questions. The church shouldn't be scared of questions either. And we don't need to be afraid of them. We just need to put them in their rightful place, to be patient with people, to love people. So how can we doubt well? How can we help others to doubt well too? I want to talk about the most famous doubter today in possibly ever. Uh, but he's in the Bible, and his name is Thomas. Thomas has such a reputation for doubting that he's actually most often called Doubting Thomas. That would be a pretty disappointing nickname to find out that you have. But the story of Thomas is much more interesting than just a person who doubted Jesus' resurrection. Yet, he still has the nickname Doubting Thomas. And it comes from a story in John chapter 20. Jesus has resurrected, and he is revealing himself to his followers and to the disciples, but Thomas isn't with everyone else when Jesus shows himself to the disciples. Thomas is somewhere else. So the disciples, they go find Thomas, and they're telling him that Jesus is back, and that he should come and, and see what they've seen. And Thomas is like, yeah, right, no, he's not. Which is actually like a pretty reasonable response. He watched Jesus die an awful death. The person that he was giving his life to is gone. And nobody had ever come back from the dead all on their own before. He was actually a vital part of the story of Lazarus, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So he had seen somebody come back from the dead, but not on their own. And he was experiencing the disappointment of losing the person he had decided to dedicate his life to. So he just wants to remain where he is. He tells the rest of the disciples in John 20, verse 25, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What we often miss in that story is that after he tells everyone this, a whole week passes before he actually gets to see Jesus. So for the next week, he might have been with these disciples listening to them go on and on about how Jesus is alive and he's back. But Thomas, if it were me, I would have just been like sitting in the corner trying to come up with theories of what they thought they might have seen or theories that they were dreaming or something or that this is some awful, awful practical joke. Until one day, it says that they're all together in a locked room and suddenly Jesus is among them. And he says to them all, peace be with you. And then he turns directly to Thomas and he says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas does this and then he declares, my Lord and my God, And I believe that we can go through this journey of doubt and deconstruction all with the story of Thomas. So let's look back to kind of where it starts. We don't really know much about who Thomas was before Jesus. Our guess is that he was maybe a fisherman. Uh, at one point he goes fishing with the other disciples, so maybe. And our, our first mention of him in most of the Gospels is when Jesus goes and he decides who his 12 disciples are going to be. And he's listed among the names. We also know that Thomas, uh, like many in those days, had two names. He had a Hebrew name, which was Thomas, and a Greek name, which was Didymus. 
And that means twin. He's like the twin. Church tradition says that it was actually because he looked a lot like Jesus, so then he was called the twin. But we don't really know for sure. Maybe he just had another twin somewhere else. And the first time that we hear of him in two of the Gospels is when Jesus sends out the twelve on their own to protect or to preach the good news, heal the sick, and drive out demons. Thomas is right there in that group. And then we see the kind of disciple that Thomas was in John chapter 11. So this is the story of Lazarus. Jesus gets word that Lazarus has died, so he tells the disciples they're going to have to go back to an area that they don't really feel safe anymore in. There's rumors of uh, Jesus not being safe in that area because of the way he's been preaching. But Jesus wants to be with Lazarus and his family. And he's telling the disciples this, and Thomas says in John 11, verse 16, let's go to and die with Jesus. Doesn't really seem like he was doubting much at that point, does it? Thomas was all in on Jesus at that point. That even though he knew that the road ahead was dangerous, maybe he was a little pessimistic, he would have rather died with Jesus than see Jesus go off on his own. So this is the faith that Thomas had at first. And it's the faith that Thomas had constructed. Because we all construct our faith at some point. Usually the church or group of believers that you begin to believe with is what is going to determine the construction of your faith. You can see this with the other Christians that you may know. People who grew up in Reformed churches are going to look different than those who grew up in Pentecostal churches. And they're going to be different from Lutherans or Baptists or Methodists. And maybe the size of the church may change the type of believer that you turn into. And the attitudes of the Christians that you begin your faith with will determine the type of faith that you have. It's a lot like how your parents determine a lot of the person that you end up becoming. Because not only is there a genetic factor which kind of determines what you're going to look like and who you'll be, but in many ways, you can act a lot like your mom and your dad. I view the world in a lot of the same ways that my parents do. I make decisions like they do. I look kind of like them. And I, in many ways, act like the churches that I grew up in. We're shaped by the people that raise us. They form who we become. And to put it in the terms of this series, the soundtracks that surround us as we grow up begin to shape us. They begin to get deeply embedded in us. But we all get to a point where we begin to question these soundtracks. And that's where we begin our next phase, deconstruction. This is the phase that so many people are worried about today. We have many, many young people who are loudly and proudly deconstructing their faith. And that scares leaders and parents and friends because it feels like, more often than not, deconstruction is driving people right out of churches. But we all end up deconstructing at some point, and we may not call it that, but we do. And it's a really natural thing for us to do. At some point, we look at our origins and go like, maybe that was good, but this part? I don't know about that. What was that all about? So let's use the examples of families in general. You might have come from a healthy family background or from an unhealthy family. For both of these, in order to grow and get better, we end up looking back at our families and going like, yeah, my parents were great, but they had some really unhealthy views on work or money or discipline or whatever it may be. And we decide we want to do our families differently. Or if our families were not so good, we might look back and go like, all of this was bad, and I want to do everything differently, but like my mom always spent a lot of time with me or she always worked hard or whatever that might be for you. We want to hold on to that one thing, but we, we deconstruct the rest. And we all deconstruct where we came from and we determine how we're going to rebuild it. And we do that with our faith too. I spent a lot of time in this church as a kid but in my teenage years, which were like maybe more formative, 
I went to a different church in the city. And I had a lot of friends there, and I met with God there. And it was really good for me. But I also knew, even when I was a teenager, there were some things that were wrong there. It was no secret that it was a pretty high-conflict church. People fought with each other. The pastor and the people who attended butted heads often. There was a lot of conflict happening in that church in my time there. And I could have leaned into that and gotten involved, but I always, it always felt wrong to me. Because I don't believe that Jesus calls us to beat each other down or disrespect each other. And somehow that kind of behavior had showed up there. And so I resolved at a really young age that I would always be looking to make positive change in my churches, that I wouldn't get caught up in conflict, that my role in a church would be to try to make it better and more Christ-like instead of trying to get my own way or to divide. Because I didn't like seeing the conflict that existed in the church I grew up in. And I don't know what some of us have, have had to maybe deconstruct here. Maybe you grew up in a church where there were huge fights over music. That was a really common one. Um, often older people, they wanted music to be psalms or hymns with a song leader and a piano. And the young people wanted to be guitar and drums and newer music. And maybe some people listening here had to deconstruct their views around worshiping Jesus through music. For younger people today, I don't have stats on this, but I would say that the number one thing that they are deconstructing are the church's views around sex and sexuality. It's a huge issue in the church today because the world around us is really quickly changing their views on sex and gender and sexuality, and people want answers from the church. And they're trying to figure out how these churches that hold on to traditional views can fit into the world that they live in. And there's other things like music or church values or preaching styles that people deconstruct. But by far the biggest thing I would say that people care about is sexuality. So they deconstruct. They ask questions. They look at what was good and what wasn't about their churches. And doubt begins to creep in. For loved ones, this is the scary part. For parents of teenagers and young adults, this can be really scary. Because you can't force a child into faith. Everybody has to come to terms with their own faith journey We're on their own. In fact, for parents, it is actually an act of faith to pass on your views of religion onto your kids. You can't control what they walk away with. You can only tell them a story of faith and of Jesus and hope that what you have told them is so beautiful and so captivating that they will never want to walk away. Because at some point we who believe all looked at the gospel and went, wow, that's amazing. I think that's worth giving my life to. And we want our kids to be able to do the same. But then we watch them take it apart. And that's hard. And we have to figure out how to walk alongside them as they go. What we see in Thomas is that after Jesus died, he deconstructed really quickly. Right away, he seemed to be alone and he was upset that Jesus, this man he believed to be the Messiah, the one he had put all of his hope in, wasn't who he thought he was. Because Jesus was dead. The dream he had was dead. And he's mourning the loss. So when the other disciples came to him and told him Jesus was alive, Thomas tells them the ways that he has decided that Jesus will have to prove himself in order to be able to believe in him. And that's where, for Thomas at least, we can get to that last step of doubt. And that's reconstruction. See, deconstruction doesn't have to be our end point. We eventually get to reconstruction. Reconstruction is when we're able to build our faith back up. And for Thomas, that happened really, really quickly. He doubts for about a week. 
But when he experiences Jesus in the flesh and is able to touch the holes in his hands and his side, it all comes together for him. And he is one of the first people on earth to be able to declare Jesus as my Lord and my God. Because before this moment, Thomas had been fiercely loyal to Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus right to death. And he always seemed to be a little bit pessimistic, but he was always willing to go with Jesus. And after this moment, he ends up being a missionary and eventually laying his life down for the gospel in India. But he's not the only person in the Bible who doubted and deconstructed then had to reconstruct. Elijah doubted. Gideon doubted. Abraham, the father of the faith, he doubted. His wife, Sarah, doubted. Moses, David, Jonah, Mary and Martha, Jeremiah, they all had doubts at times. But we don't view them as doubters because they persevered. They searched and they held on to faith until God proved himself faithful. And this can happen for us too. This can happen for our kids. Deconstruction can lead to a beautiful reconstruction. And I want to give you an example from Scripture. John the Baptist, he would have been born into a very religious family. His parents had been having trouble having a child, but John's father was a really important priest. And John's birth was promised when Zechariah was chosen as the priest to take the once a year trip into the most holy place of the temple. This was a huge honor that very, very few people were ever considered worthy for. So Zechariah goes into the temple and he's promised a child named John. And when he comes out, he can't speak. But then John is born and he doesn't carry on the legacy of his father. Not really. He doesn't stay in the temple. He grows up and he goes to the desert. He doesn't keep up the rituals of cleanliness and religion that his father Zechariah did. He ends up living in the wilderness wearing like animal furs and a big leather belt. And you can imagine that he probably had a pretty wild and kind of unclean beard. Yet he believes in the same God as his father. But rather than focusing on the traditions of the Jewish temple, he preaches about the soon coming Messiah who would get rid of the need for a temple. Because soon the presence of God would not be found in a building or in a place. The presence of God would be walking among them. John the Baptist carried on his father's faith, but not in the same way. He believed in the same God. He held on to the same truth, but he reconstructed around what he knew was coming. And we don't know much about his parents after he was born, but you can imagine they might have been like a little confused when he ended up living in the wilderness and eating bugs with honey. But he built a faith that was so beautiful and built on the truth. So much so that Jesus actually said in Matthew 11, verse 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not been anyone greater than John the Baptist. I don't know what kind of pressure or expectation John might have had growing up. But he ended up with a faith that was so great that Jesus honored him and said no one was greater. So where is your deconstruction taking you? What are you reconstructing into? What do we need to do in order to reconstruct in a beautiful and truthful way? Well, here's three quick things as we close for you as you walk through doubts and deconstruction or as you help to walk other people through their doubts. First off, figure out what you're actually looking for. Part of deconstruction that gets us pointed in a different direction from Jesus is that we get mixed up with what we actually want from the process. The truth is that part of God loving us is that he actually gives us what we want most of the time. 
If you want to experience him, you can find that. But if you want to go make a lot of money and live for the weekend and sleep around with whoever you want, he'll probably let you do that too. God doesn't demand that we love him. He reveals himself to us in the hopes that we will choose to love him. And he knows that sometimes some of us won't choose him. So we have to figure out what we want. And my first question might be to you, do you love Jesus? Because a lot of people say that they love Jesus and they're fascinated by him, but they're sick of the church or religion or rules. And that's okay. Jesus can handle that. But as you walk through doubt and deconstruction, can you work to keep Jesus and the goodness of God at the center of the issue? Because too many people lose that and they look back and go, well, Jesus seemed great, but I couldn't get past everything else. I couldn't get past all the, all the harm that the church has done. And then unfortunately, they let it all go. So hold on to Jesus as you go. Number two, connect to community. One thing that we notice in Thomas's story is that when the disciples met the resurrected Jesus, he wasn't there. Maybe that was just a coincidence that Thomas wasn't there, but maybe he was like pouting and he refused to be with them as he was mourning. I don't know, but because of his disconnect from that group, he missed out on an encounter with God. So don't leave community. Stick with your community. Stay connected. Because if you have people around you who love Jesus and are open to questions, keep them close. You don't need to go away to figure out your questions. You can look to other places for answers, but too many people go away to figure out what they believe. And we are just so much more vulnerable when we go off on our own. The enemy loves an isolated Christian. So keep your community close. And number three is that Jesus can handle your doubts. One more thing that we notice in the story of Thomas is that when Jesus finally got near him, he did not hesitate to encounter his doubt. He comes right to Thomas and he says, touch my hands, touch my side. He doesn't get mad at him for doubting. He doesn't worry that the holes in his hands won't be proof enough. He gets near Thomas and he answers him. Jesus isn't scared that you might doubt him. Jesus wants your questions. He wants to prove himself faithful. He's not mad that you have questions. Jesus loves you. And when Jesus loves us, we find that he is patient and he is kind and gracious and he's willing to give you time to figure it out. So if you're struggling, if you have questions or if you have a loved one who is struggling, I encourage you not to panic. Give it to Jesus. He wants to help. A.J. Swoboda, who is an author who um, his book After Doubt helped to kind of form a lot of what this message became. He wrote about doubt and he said that to struggle with one's faith is often the surest sign that we actually have one. If you're struggling with your faith, that means that on some level you have faith. And so your doubt doesn't have to be the end. It may just be the beginning of a new and beautiful reconstruction of your faith. None of us end up following Jesus perfectly. We're all imperfect people trying to do our best to follow a perfect God. That's our goal. It's to follow Jesus, to keep him front and center, to stay in our communities. And to construct a beautiful faith that follows Jesus, that follows the truth of his word. And that causes us to look more like Jesus did. And we can do that together. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you love us, that you care about us, 
that you're not afraid of our doubts and our questions, but that you take them on with all of the grace and the love of a good and perfect Father. And for those of us listening who are doubting, who are questioning, and who are feeling upset by the questions that we have, may you just draw near to us. May you give us the confidence that we need to answer those questions. For those of us who have loved ones who are doubting, who are watching our, our kids deconstruct their faith, or who, uh, who have people in our lives who have walked away from the faith that they had when they were kids, I just pray that you would reassure us, that you would inspire us to pray more, to, to lean on you more, and that we would see friends and children and loved ones who have walked away come back to you, God. That this would just be a season where we see so many people who have walked away coming back to the faith that they once knew, to the, the God who loves them, to a Savior who died for them. In your will, I just pray that this would be done. Thank you for who you are. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I hope this helped you. And uh, if you don't have a church community and you're watching this and you're in Winnipeg, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to get to know you. Um, maybe you have questions. I believe that this is a great community to walk those questions through together with. Um, so God bless you. I hope you have a great week. If you want to know more about us, there's links in the description of this video. And I uh, hope to see you again next week. God bless you.